Hey, Emmanuel, how's it going? All right, it's going well, Joe. Awesome. Good to see you. Likewise, yeah. So we got uh, Emmanuel Raj today on the Data Nerd Herd, all the way from uh, Helsinki, Finland. <laughs> so it's awesome. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks yeah. for inviting. Awesome. So for people who don't know who you are, do you want to give a quick intro? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Emmanuel Raj. I'm based in Helsinki, Finland. It's uh, quite a pretty part, actually. Not uh, many know, but it's been voted as the fourth uh, happiest, for, for four times, the happiest place in the world, Finland. And it's a pleasure to be based here. And I'm a senior machine learning engineer. I work at a company here called Theato Every. I have around six years of industry experience working as a machine learning engineer in the industry. And I had the pleasure of working in multiple disciplines uh, across healthcare, uh, also manufacturing, finance, and so forth. So yeah, um, um, I, I think I've got to learn quite some and uh, it's been an exciting journey throughout these years. That's awesome. Um, I mean, the ML engineering, engineering space is pretty new as well as ML ops. I mean, what, what got you into, uh, you know, these, these particular fields or, or field, I suppose. Right. Uh, well, six years ago when I was a student, uh, doing engineering, a bachelor's, uh, this field of artificial intelligence that resonated quite a lot with me. And I thought this has some cool, uh, algorithms and statistics and math involved that has the power to solve a lot of problems uh, around the world and uh, across these years um, there was a lot of hype around AI and ML and I always wanted to see uh, from an engineering point of view how we can solve problems using this technology and that was the one that quite got me interested in AI and ML and it's been quite interesting to watch how ML has been uh, integrated into software engineering across these years. And I think it's taking a nice shape uh, that we're getting to a place where we are able to mass operationalize machine learning in order to solve real world problems. Yeah, so I mean, walk me through that. How did you teach yourself then, uh, you know, a lot of these, um, uh, you know, aspects of ML engineering? Cause I, I you know, I, I, I was around at that time too and there really wasn't a lot in terms of you know, ML engineering for dummies, for example, that wasn't like a thing back in the day. So, right. yeah, how did you, how did you yeah. figure all that out? Yeah, you're right. There wasn't much or there wasn't a career path that you could choose and say that, oh, we'll become a machine learning engineer or right. become a data scientist. It was a lot about throwing uh, myself in situations where uh, the problems needed to be solved and there needed to be innovation. And uh, thankfully, I got to keep myself in such situations and uh, tackle that and even talk to the people, collaborate with uh, people who have this growth mindset to solve problems and uh, yeah, put machine learning to solve these problems and iterate over the problems and test and know the business value that generates. And in this process, uh, while learning by doing, I think that uh, uh, helped me onboard on this journey uh, with machine learning and even on software engineering angle because a lot of it comes down to making machine learning work at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And you mentioned learning by doing. Um, I mean, what were some of the, uh, what were some of the mistakes that you made early on? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, especially relying on uh, people to guide or waiting for people to guide me rather than me being proactive was one thing um, I, I feel like I wasted some time there, but being proactive and uh, working with people and approaching with approaching them with questions uh, helped me get somewhere. And also learning by doing a lot happens. Um, thankfully, in the last couple of years, we've had this revolution of online education. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of courses available, different people bringing different perspectives. Um, I think that helped quite a lot learning from there and also doing practical projects and uh, collaborating with the open source community to discuss problems and understand different ways of uh, solving problems and exploring different ways of software engineering. Interesting. Uh, that was, uh, yeah. What were some of the courses that you found it uh, useful? Yeah, uh, 
five years back, uh, I think this was quite a hit by um, uh, Pontevis, Hade Lin Pontevis, if I pronounce his name right. And it was by Super Data Science, this community. Mm. Uh, and Kirill Emirenko and uh, Pontevis made the course uh, for machine learning on Udemy. That was a nice starter because I came from the background of uh, software engineering. And uh, yeah, that was quite a nice starter to begin with uh, for for someone who's not quite a book nerd, but learns by doing and looking at online education and by talking to people. So that uh, was a good one. That's pretty hilarious, actually. You say you're not a book nerd because um, <laughs> you wrote a book. Right. Yeah, I ended up writing a yeah. book. Uh, Let me uh, share in, this real uh, quick. This is, yeah, there's a Vandal's new book. So engineering ML ops. Um, so for a person who's not a book nerd, what possessed you to go ahead and write a book? Uh, it's a lot of right. work. Um, yeah, um, I ended up writing the book. Um, I myself was not a book, big book nerd, but I saw a lot of value because there's a lot of knowledge in the books and uh, books explain things more clearly. Uh, and there's a lot to capture uh, from the books. And uh, well, I have this philosophy in life that everyone has weaknesses. I had the weakness of uh, not being a good writer, like 10 years ago, back in when I was in the university. And yeah, I took it up as a challenge to master that art. And I took this challenge um, eventually uh, to write a book. And I, I felt somewhere along the journey as a machine learning engineer four years ago, when uh, there was a need to have this standardized way of developing software to bring machine learning to production. When MLOps was developing, I didn't find many resources myself. Uh, there was a lot of discussion. There was a lot of confusion, conflicting ideas here and there, all scattered across the net. So I took this opportunity to compile everything on this book and explain it in a clear and simple language, uh, especially for people who are very curious to learn hands-on implementation, especially the data scientists and machine learning engineers and also any business person in the tech company, because I felt like uh, this was the key to operationalize machine learning um, along the years. So overcoming the weakness, I would give you to that, to become a writer, a good good writer, yes. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Um... There's a, there's a lot to unpack here, uh, which we'll, which we will. Um, but there's also a lot, as you point out, there's a lot of materials, a lot of ideas, um, a lot of, I would say, still conflicting ideas about ML engineering and ML ops. I mean, how did you gather all this information, of which there's no shortage? There's a lot of information out there, and then right. decide like what what am I going to keep uh, for this book? What are, what are we going to use? What are we going to you know? not right. use and evolve hmm. yeah there's a lot of information out there and uh, thankfully i live uh, live among uh, a lot of engineers here in finland who are already working on hands-on projects and also uh, thankfully as the COVID came along we have they had this technological shift where people started to be online and we could discuss with people around the world so uh, well uh, it came a lot from discussing different approaches and also, especially implementing it myself uh, across different industries, such as healthcare, manufacturing, finance. And I followed this, uh, I bought this research angle to it, uh, where I was recently doing a master's thesis, in applying research uh, and following this uh, data um, uh, design science approach by uh, Beringa. There's a book on that where you take uh, architecture or a methodology and iterate it across a lot of um, problems or industries or setup or people. And then you come up with a specific design uh, that can be generic across all. So it was uh, coming from a research perspective, also from applied industry perspective, talking to a lot of people, implementing myself, uh, collaborating with many other engineers and taking feedback uh, along the way and asking questions and, and so forth. So that's how I decided to uh, also, the idea with the book was that uh, to demystify MLOps or to keep it simple mm -hmm. and practical because we can go a lot to theoretical 
and uh, philosophical angle, but a lot of it comes down to practical at the end to implement and be able to solve problems. So I go across uh, different aspects of machine learning ops, uh, such as uh, how to build machine learning models, uh, where we try different approaches and we talk about auto ML and so forth. And then we go to deploying machine learning models where we test different infrastructures and build microservices that can be in form of REST APIs or also streaming services. The book covers in a generic sense and gets you prepared mm -hmm. um, in order to approach or tackle almost any problem in the industry in a practical way. That's really cool. It's a tough topic to tackle too, um, especially when you're trying to bring it down to make it practical, right? Um, for various use cases. I mean, what are some of the key elements uh, for making machine learning practical uh, in production? Right. Um, I think one key element, or I recently come across this stat, uh, and also I've been coming across for the last couple of years that around 87% uh, or 90% 90, 90 of machine learning projects are failing. Uh, there's a lot of hype, but we're not able to productionize. And also there was a survey done by one of the popular tech firms, um, which focuses on applying AI and machine learning on the industry. Mm -hmm. And some of the top reasons that came out that machine learning was not being able to adopt, adopt in the industry is because of lack of continual learning. Um, and uh, I think machine learning ops tackles that problem of continual learning and tackles the problem of execution in the industry. And yeah, a lot of it comes down to uh, that where we uh, we focus on tackling continual learning. Mm. When you say continual, are you talking about continuous learning or uh, continual or is there a yeah. difference? Uh, I mean, it. it in technical terms, it comes down to the same thing, uh, right. where you, you put the machine learning model in production and it continuously evolves with the data and mm. the environment. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like right now it, 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 the, the paradigm is very much batch oriented, I think at most companies, um, if even batch oriented, like companies might, might deploy a model and that's just like the last time they deploy it. Um, it's kind of yeah. like how software was back in the day. So, right. yeah. That's interesting. And, and then um, what are some, so walk me through that then, if a company is in batch mode right now, what are some ways they can move and progress towards doing continual learning? Right, um, I think it has to do a lot with the cultural shift uh -huh. or the mindset shift to be data-driven company. And it comes with, the, with making the decision that uh, we will focus on the data and try to drive business value out of that. And also machine learning ops is ideal for such situations because it helps you derive value from your data uh, in terms of deploying machine learning solutions to solve business problems. And at the end of the day, machine learning ops does that. It helps you have a platform, uh, a machine learning or data platform that helps you collaborate within the company also with your stakeholders um, in order to build solutions, to deploy them, and especially to monitor them because a lot of companies get lost when it comes to monitoring uh, the ML solutions in, in terms of how, how good uh, is the solution in terms of um, giving you a business value uh, that you're desiring. So uh, I think uh, that way companies can um, can extract a lot of value by having machine learning ops and focusing on on all of these aspects mm -hmm. in a structural uh, manner. It seems like it borrows a lot of the ideas from um, like DevOps, for example. Is that is that fair? Yeah, you can say that. Okay. Uh, and for people who are software engineers and also a lot of uh, people who work in tech companies, they they relate to DevOps quite much. And mm -hmm. in my book also, I've covered this uh, about the evolution of machine learning ops. Because if you look at the way software engineering has evolved, we started with the waterfall model where it was unidirectional. We developed a software unidirectional. Then we moved to agile 
way of working. Uh, it was working with the customers and the users, uh, but then we go, went to DevOps and it's fair enough to say, I think machine learning ops is uh, DevOps for machine learning in a way. And uh, at the end of the day, how it is different from DevOps is um, you have uh, data and then code. And if you don't have uh, machine learning ops, they both develop uh, parallelly over the time because you're incrementally collecting data and then you're uh, also parallelly coding and developing code to deal with that data. And machine learning ops brings together both data and code together in a, in a bi-directional way where you can track every step and reproduce and govern your ML system to achieve business value. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So walk me through this. I, I think for, for the audience too, maybe they, there's some confusion out there. Like there's terms like data ops, data engineering, and then there's ML ops and ML engineering, and obviously the, mm. the dev equivalent. How would you make the distinction between, let's start out with data ops and ML ops, or is there a distinction? Right. Uh, I mean, and these are all different terms, but at the heart of all these terms is uh, the thing called a pipeline. And I think uh, everyone who's working in these different uh, terminologies at the end of the day ends up building a pipeline. Um, may it be data ops, may it be ML ops or ML engineering. Uh, and uh, I think all of this points us to the operationalization of uh, data operationalization of data and deploying this uh, in production in a structural, iterative and reproducible manner. And uh, well, we can define these terms in multiple ways, uh, but uh, I don't see a lot of difference when we talk about data ops, machine learning ops, uh, machine learning engineering, and all of these uh, terms. And, and maybe it comes down to the hype at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's something I'm struggling with too at the moment, because as I look into what, uh, say, ML engineering is doing and data engineering, I mean, it seems on one hand, there's like these parallel universes where um, data engineering more takes the raw data ingredients and makes them useful to data science, which then ML engineering would pick up and there's its own sort of life cycle after that. On the flip side, though, um, there's... I don't know, I, for me, I, I sense maybe not right now, but soon the boundaries between even software engineering ml engineering and data engineering are really going to start blurring um because right. there's a whole continuum and it's it's hard to say where one starts and the other ends i suppose and you know especially given the evolution of technologies right now so right i agree it's like we are in a funnel we are pouring, pouring all these things and at the end of the day after it is time and it is time, mm -hmm. uh, we'll have unification of all of this into maybe software engineering. It will, we will change the way where we're developing software in a different way. Maybe we yeah. do it by MLOps. Mm -hmm. Right. Are, are you kind of saying like, uh, like ML would also be writing code then? And be possible. Yeah. And uh, maybe that's uh, a step towards artificial general intelligence as well. Possibly, yeah. Mm. Yeah, Cause, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, you, you, when you talk about uh, stuff like AI, for example, right? At least to me, is there's still a long ways to go before there's a lot of, um, I think, kind of universal practicality to sort of a generalized, uh, which doesn't exist yet, right? But right. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's an interesting thought experiment. Um, I feel like we're still in the early days too, which is kind of exciting because like we're still just getting to the point where we can like figure out how we're going to deploy these things um, and get people on board with uh, you know processes and stuff. So yeah, it's right, uh, right. Yeah, I, I came across this uh, fascinating uh, project by IBM. It's called CodeNet, where it's focusing on accumulating uh, code where software writes code by itself, and there are a couple of projects happening around this area. So uh, interesting days ahead, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. What, so, you know, are, are, are you part of any of the uh, the ML engineering or ML ops uh, communities out there right now? I am part of uh, some communities. Yeah. That's cool. And also the ML ops community as well. Nice, yeah. I mean, I, I find it really cool that, you know, over the past couple of years that it, there's suddenly been, um, 
I think everyone coming together in the industry because it seemed like for the longest time everyone was kind of out, you know, in the wilderness uh, doing their own thing. And um, I mean, how much, how, well, you know, getting, getting uh, you know, attached to these, these groups, like how much did that help, help you write your book and clarify your thinking around um, you know, the right. ideas in this? Um, it's really cool that we're trying to come together and we realize that there's a need for a standardized way of uh, building software. Otherwise, we're all lone strangers in the forest trying to do the same thing in 100 different ways. So it's cool that we have these platforms and we can have these discussions. And at the end of the day, all of this is leading to uh, standardization mm -hmm. and efficiency and helping each other out. Uh, it's cool. Uh, for me, it helped quite a lot to see the discussions and also engage uh, in, in, in knowing how others are solving similar problems in their own unique way uh, so that I don't have to make the same mistake. We can learn from each other. Were there any situations where you found people where um, like almost on polar opposites ends of the spectrum when you were evaluating just how different people were doing stuff? Did you find things that were just like wildly, uh, I guess, different? Uh, yeah, uh, there's this area in uh, machine learning ops, which is still quite uh, developing and it's the area of monitoring. Uh, many people have uh, different opinions and ways how they want to do. And yeah, I found myself uh, in situations quite much because uh, there's a lot of scattered information and different ways of monitoring ML solution. And yeah, other people had other ways of doing. I had uh, my own way of doing, and then we come together and we discuss our approaches and it, helps quite a lot to, to actually hear out and also learn from people who have different opinions. And at the end of the day, I think that's where a great amount of learning comes from, mm -hmm. learning from people who have different uh, polarizing ideas. Right. Something to be respected. Yeah, it is. It is, especially when, because it, it seems like all these people have developed their own, uh, when talking about monitoring or observability, for example, right? It's, it's people have made, solutions that or in a lot of cases tailor made for what they're trying to observe right and so you know and that's that's fascinating like are the did you find any common best practices around monitoring right um i tried to but i couldn't <laughs> then i took in inputs from uh, multiple uh, people who are working in the industry and i made something called the explainable monitoring framework and it's it's part of the book where it's a three phase uh, or three module process where you focus on uh, monitoring your machine learning model in terms of data drift, model drift, and also the application performance. And then you analyze it, which is the second model. And in the analyzing, you analyze if there's any potential bias or threat in the model, or you can do data slicing and see for different demographics how the model is performing. Then you can look into local and global explanations. And then the third component is, of course, the govern component, where you deal with potential alerts in your system and uh, monitor for logs and foresee any problems that might come in order to govern your ML system so that you're able to get the best business efficacy for your business problem uh, at hand. So it's a, a in order to deal with this uh, problem of so much scattered information around ML monitoring, yeah, I, I propose this framework and yeah, hopefully um, it helps uh, some people to as a starting point. It's interesting. Huh, how would you, um, on the issue of like bias, uh, and, and data sets and models. I mean, what did you find to be the best approaches to tackling that? Because yeah, that's a huge, it's a huge um, area of discussion right now. It is, and it's a, it's a huge uh, discussion topic, even uh, when it comes to politics and law, it's, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, uh, bias um, is an important aspect in machine learning. And yeah, we're all in this pursuit of understanding uh, why a machine learning model makes such a certain decision and how it does that. And some some methods that have helped me quite some have been uh, SHAP, Shapely Additive uh, Permutations, 
um, that's been quite useful, especially to unbox the black box. And when you have simple machine learning models, which are tree-based, you can, of course, understand what is happening in there. But yeah, SHAP uh, and also LIME, these sort of uh, methods to, to study the decisions that the model is making also to understand the feature attributions and also which feature is making um, is adding up to making a certain decision is also important to understand. It kind of seems at the end that it's somewhat how we as humans function as well. The way we make decisions when we study the features and attributes, what experiences, we have all subjective experiences. Likewise, models also have subjective uh, learning from the data. It's interesting to see how features contribute to uh, different ways of making decisions and at the end of the day that makes the bias and uh, uh, well bias is inevitable we have it as humans and at least we see it transparently in the machines so there is scope where we can improve the models and make it as much fair as we can to solve uh, problems out there but yeah this is a sensitive topic and can be quite many approaches yeah it seems these are the ones Especially in, in light of, you know, when we're talking about, you know, notions of uh, just operations, right, which is, as we, we've talked about, it's a cultural phenomenon as much as a technical one, um, getting stakeholders on board and, and iterating, you know, very quickly. I mean, what, do you have any advice for companies that are struggling with um, iterating on things like bias or, or just features in general, uh, feature importance, uh, you know, anything related to that? Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, well, a lot of companies, um, especially when it comes to data scientists, um, they seem to be working siloed, mm -hmm. especially in big companies. There are a lot of units and teams uh, that are working in silos. And the first step towards um, addressing bias is to have a standardized approach or mechanism, first of all, to develop machine learning solutions. And then this mechanism should also enable them to have transparency, which I think machine learning ops does that quite well. And adding this explainable monitoring um, to this mechanism where every, every stakeholder who is collaborating in the company and also with the customers can see um, how operations are being formulated and how decisions are being made. And also, especially when it comes to social networks and so forth, I think giving extra transparency to see why a decision is being made and going to the feature level and explaining people why a decision is being made mm -hmm. can bring a lot of value and also peace in the society uh, with the discussions they're having and also the decisions may, being made around their life. Interesting. Now, one area that we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in, in data engineering, for example, is uh, data governance. for, for yeah, you know, I think for a lot of reasons, it's becoming uh, it's becoming the hot topic. Um, are you seeing similar things with uh, uh, the ML space as well, and ML engineering? Right. Uh, uh, the topic of data governance is also quite important for machine learning operations mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we are all working with data to create value. And I've come across a problem which was quite intriguing. Uh, especially across Europe, um, or maybe this is also in America. And the problem is such that when we look at the research world, uh, it can be universities, also companies like uh, Pfizer, Moderna, Bayer, who are working on problems such as cancer, for example, breast cancer, all of them, um, like they have huge amounts of funding to solve the same problem, but they don't have access to the same data set. They have the same problem, but not the same data set. So for example, they don't have this standard data lake uh, where everything is dumped mm. and data is governed and given access to, to a particular parties. And yeah, this problem of uh, data governance and having the capability to share data with each other and to version the data uh, and backtrack to the operations that were implemented using that data. Uh, the machine learning ops is quite good at that. And uh, this is quite an important problem for us to solve and progress as humanity. Um, and I guess we see exponential progress ahead to solve these problems and having such mechanisms in place can 
enable us to be much more efficient. Mm -hmm. Any uh, tools or technologies come to mind that might uh, help our audience, um, I guess, kind of get started in this area of data governance and uh, right. versioning? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think a lot of um, cloud players have their own tooling. And uh, somewhere to begin with is, um, I think, uh, the clouds, Amazon, Azure, and also Google has uh, good solutions to work around. Um, and my focus is machine learning, so I could only recommend tools um, yeah. around machine learning and data right. governance. Uh, so for example, uh, one open source uh, tool that is quite useful is the machine uh, MLflow mm. that helps you to tag your machine learning models to the data sets that you're using and also the Azure machine learning service, uh, which is quite good at doing that. Also the Amazon's uh, SageMaker as well. So I think these are good tools to get started with. And there are a lot of startups working in this space and a ton. <laughs> yes, a ton. Uh, and yeah, I, every problem can be solved with multiple tools, but it's choosing, it's about choosing the right ones. That brings up an interesting question. So given the number of tools out there right now, both from the clouds and from startups, like how would you go about um, figuring out what to use. Right. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a jigsaw puzzle to figure out the right tools. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, we need to bring the data and infrastructure together. So, I mean, if you have a one-stop solution for all, that's well and good. You can easily integrate everything and it all works smoothly. But if you use multiple tools, you might need um, effort in integrations and testing uh, and to keep the robustness uh, there in your uh, solution. So a good place to start with is the clouds. Fortunately or unfortunately, they're taking over the market <laughs> and eating this uh, space out for MLOps. And I think there are great solutions, even the Amazon, uh, Azure, and the Google Cloud uh, as well. And there's a lot of tools coming up in open source um, as well, like MLflow yeah. um, and so forth, yes. Yeah, interesting. Do, do you, I mean, you're in Finland, do you, do you have access to other clouds? Um, I think, doesn't Yandex have a cloud as well and uh, right. others, uh, yeah. They have um, Yandex and Alibaba. I mean, we have a lot of players here. Yeah. But also this clouds, uh, there are multiple clouds. This is also, uh, this might also be a problem. Uh, mm. We might get vendor locked. Uh, so there's yeah. a cool solution uh, I came across. It's called Valohai. Um, it's a Finnish uh, company that has developed a machine learning ops uh, solution that can plug and play to any cloud, major player, uh, major cloud player like Amazon, uh, Azure, or GCP. I think uh, these kind of solutions can be quite handy to be uh, away from the vendor lock and and also to support startups. What's it called? Valohai, V-A-L-H-O-H-A-I. Okay, I'm gonna check that out. That sounds kind of cool. Yes. Um, it sounds like it just takes a kind of a multi-cloud approach then to ML apps, which is yeah, I mean, you bring up the issue of like vendor lock-in, and I think this is it's a it's a real concern because especially given how early things are, there's not a consolidated winner uh, yet. Um, mm. You know, even in the clouds, right? Let alone like the bajillion tools, open you know, third-party tools out there. I have no idea who who wins right. in any of those spaces, right? Um, yeah, and so vendor lock-in is an interesting one. I mean, I I, I kind of take the philosophy that you need to be really flexible and uh, basically bolt on uh, best of breed components, but be willing to take those out when something better comes along because something better will come along. Uh, right, at the totally. Stage. Yeah. Agreed. So, yeah. Yeah, I share, I share the same philosophy as well. Ultimately, it's about solving it the best way, the most optimal way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it makes it kind of interesting because if you're, if you're in AWS, for example, and in SageMaker, I mean, it's a great tool, but to make SageMaker work, you kind of have to go all in with SageMaker to really right. like do it the SageMaker way, right? And so that's kind of the, the catch-22 with a lot of these, but, and uh, same with Google, same with Azure. I mean, they all want you to be in their cloud and 
And AI mm -hmm. is, you know, data is like the sort of the gateway drug to get, you know, using all the other services. Cause if you get the data in, um, you know, that's, it's painful to get it back out. So, right. It is. Yeah. Especially as your data grows, because then you have egress fees and everything else. And that's, uh, that's not exactly. fun. Exactly. And also these cloud players are expensive compared to um, the open source solutions or even your on-prem solutions. So it's right. about making that choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, any, anything else about it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we talk, your book. Your book is very extensive. I mean, if you were to summarize, maybe some of the uh, best practices, you know, or essentials for like releasing in production, what would those be? Right. Um, I think uh, some some things I can highlight from the book uh, are especially when it comes to deployment and monitoring. I, I guess we're, we're, there are a lot of data scientists who know to build machine learning models, but I would suggest them to look tools uh, in order to uh, collaborate while doing that process. And that will help them quite much save some time uh, because I had a, a customer I was helping and this company had uh, multiple data scientists working on the same problem, developing the same model, doing the same mundane tasks again and again. Uh, having a platform would help you save 50% of the time, let's say. So uh, yeah, begin with that. And for deployment, uh, learning some standard tools, which are uh, around making microservices can be quite helpful uh, because these days we don't wanna end up building monolithic uh, solutions and keep working on that uh, and develop legacy systems that might be extinct in the next five years. So mm -hmm. microservices are the way to go. So Docker um, is cool uh, to, to, to build your microservices. And also for any data scientist or machine learning engineer, I would suggest to look into fast AI, which is quite cool. It helps you build high performance and scalable uh, machine learning solution. Uh, just by using a Docker file, it helps you containerize the solution and you're able to deploy. And in general, I would recommend um, teams to have uh, practices where it encourages clean code and uh, uh, reviews uh, in a collaborative way and have principles uh, that help them to come to a common consensus around code and that helps them make software fast in production. And the key to having a good deployment mechanism is to build a great CI CD pipeline. Uh, without the pipeline, we're just like a bunch of data scientists working in a company. So aim to build this CI CD pipeline where you have uh, different phases of um, uh, to develop and to test the solution and also to deploy the solution. So do it in a structured way. It can be completely automated or it can be in a continuous uh, delivery manner where you can have human agents or your product owners who are monitoring the solutions. And this way you're able to change the code and get that in production in a quick and efficient manner, rather than talking to multiple people and wasting your time doing mundane things. Uh, <laughs> and when it comes to monitoring, uh, well, a lot of companies underestimate this area. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is quite important when it comes to utilizing your resources efficiently and to track uh, how you're progressing as a company and as a team uh, to drive value from data uh, for business. So uh, monitoring your application and being ready when it fails to deploy another solution and to be foresee possible errors, tackle, foresee, tackle errors and also to audit the solution and have a mechanism where you review the solution and monitor it periodically. And having these sort of mechanisms can, can really help a company and also individuals, data scientists, and it becomes a lot of fun to mm -hmm. work like that. Right. This is awesome. And it's such a giant step forward really from, from a lot of the, uh, I guess, the traditional uh, data science workflows right now. So. Yeah, I, I hope more more companies can adopt this this, this methodology, and, and I think that they will. I mean, they, I don't know if there's much of a choice. So, right, I think so as well. I think MLOps is going to become uh, mainstream, or many companies will see 
value in adopting this way of working. Yeah, I mean, on that note, I mean, where do you where do you see things going for ML ops and ML engineering over the next, we'll call it five years? Yeah, um, I think it's a big win win for ML ops in the next five years because now a lot of influencers in the AI space, for example, Andrew Ng, uh, who's talking about this, and a lot of influencers are chipping in to emphasize on operationalizing ML uh, models or ML solutions. And uh, it's uh, as we we increasingly see the value that it brings in terms of business when the business stakeholders realize how ML ops is able to help your data scientists and resources to be more efficient, save certain percentage of time and money, and also uh, to use your resources because AI, training AI models can be expensive. And when you, when you, uh, when you provision GPUs and TPUs, and if you don't utilize them dynamically and you keep it running statically all the time, it can be quite expensive. So MLOps help you optimize that. So when companies start seeing this value, um, I think a lot of companies will start adopting MLOps. And at least here in Europe, I, I see that the, um, the, the air is changing when it comes to mm. being open to experiment with MLOps. And also MLOps is a cultural change where it takes time for the company to build this common platform uh, and to start seeing this value. So iteratively, as time goes by, I think uh, it's going to be a big win-win. And back in 2015, I heard Andrew NG say about uh, AI is the new electricity. So I see it as that when electricity came and then we had to develop this mechanism to have a factory to mass produce electricity around the world. And now we need a new mechanism to make uh, AI to mass produce in companies and around the world. So I believe the new mechanism is MLOps mm -hmm. to distribute the new electricity. Around the right. World. Yeah, it's kind of back in the old days with electricity when you, I mean, you might be able to produce it, but you're like hand cranking it for yourself. And that's kind of what I think where data science has been for the you know, last several years. Um, it's interesting too, because, you know, on the notion of electricity, it's been around for a really long time now. And like, you don't walk into a house and say, wow, this is really cool. It's, it's electricity powered, right? Like, right. who cares? I, I think the same thing's going to happen with AI, where it's going to be so ubiquitous and so baked into almost every process that it's, um, this stuff will just go into the background. And you'll notice, you'll only know about it when it's not working, just like when the power goes out, you're like, huh, I guess that is kind of important, <laughs> isn't it? Um, like, we need power. Um, you know, but it, it, it's exactly. Yeah. But, but right now, like AI is like, you know, the, the sexy thing and, you know, data is new oil and yada, yada, yada. And, and it's, mm. yeah, I'm it, looking forward to the day when actually all this stuff just goes into sort of the ether, like, or like when the internet first came out, like that was like the cool thing. It's like, this is like the internet and nobody's fascinated by it right now. I mean, you and I are talking, you know, in other parts of the globe, literally uh, at, right now. Um, using the internet, but it's not like we got in the conversation like, wow, this is, the internet's kind of cool. Like this is like the future and stuff. Um, right. You're so used to it now, so. It becomes norm as we go along. The same will happen with MLOps, I think. And people will only see the need for it when when something goes wrong. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't go wrong too often though, <laughs> so. Oh yeah, I hope so. Um, I mean, yeah. yeah. AI has been there for 60 years now. It's about yeah. time we come up, come up with a mechanism. Mm -hmm. And a lot of false starts too, right? Like it, it, back in the day, um, you know, there's been there's been several attempts at AI, symbolic logic, and uh, mm. neural nets that saw their time like a few times. <laughs> then they imploded. It feels like this time is definitely different, though. So you know, but it's yeah, you got to make it realistic and, and useful for people, right? Because I mean, I, there was a time I think back in um, uh, 20. I was thinking maybe 2016 with the AI getting to the, the to kind of the top of the hype curve that if it wasn't productionized and people weren't able to start getting value out of it, that you would actually see a decline. Um, right. So. That happened and hopefully the curve goes up now after the hype. Yeah. Curve. Cause like ML ops sort of came around and ML engineering, I think kind of saved the day in, in some respects. Cause if that hadn't happened, I think you just would have had a bunch of board data scientists working on Jupyter notebooks, <laughs> like doing, you know, uh, random modeling and stuff. Um, right. 
Switching gears a bit. I mean, so you're located in Finland. You, you mentioned earlier, it's like, you know, it's been the happiest place on earth for, for quite a while now. Um, <laughs> and it also seems like there, you know, there, there's, there's a tech scene there. I mean, historically it's, it's had, um, you know, a, a, quite a pedigree of tech companies. It was Ericsson and uh, Nokia, for example, or, right. Yeah. I mean, walk me through that. Like, what's it, what's it like just, you know, being mm. a ML engineer, it's a techie in Finland. Yeah, uh, I mean, Finland is an exciting place and not many know that <laughs> in tech <laughs> regards because uh, uh, we, we had uh, Nokia over here and because of that, we were able to attract a lot of smart tech uh, tech people and we have good talent over here. And also when we see at the European scale, in terms of AI research, a lot of uh, AI research is done in, in Finland and Finland, uh, I think, is an unex unexplored uh, territory in terms of uh, productionizing AI research. And that is being done right now. Um, and there, um, in, the, in the news recently, you might have seen um, Finland was able to attract almost 50% more of uh, investments in AI. So I think it's a promising place to be here. And I see a lot of cool companies coming up. For example, Malohai, who is working with cloud agnostic um, MLOps and also yeah, many, many other uh, tech companies. It's an exciting place to be around. The only thing or the downside is the winters are long here. It's uh, <laughs> other than that, it's a cool place to be here. That's awesome. Like how many, how many, uh, I mean, are there meetups in, in Helsinki where you live or what's the, uh, what's the community yeah. like there? Um, it's, um, uh, it's active. Uh, we have uh, a lot of meetups and there are two popular, uh, global conferences that happen. One is called slush. It's a startup conference, quite popular. Uh, I think one of the best in Europe. Mm -hmm. And then we have Nord Nordic business forum and at Nordic level, all the business leaders come and we have, uh, yeah, quite good discussions and a big events actually. So it's quite an active scene, um, here and even developing now that the investments are coming in and and we'll see or hear more of Finland. In the That's awesome. Days. I mean, it, it, you know, from being in, in America, you know, we, we kind of, at least I look at Europe as being maybe there's some companies that are doing really innovative stuff, like Spotify comes to mind, uh, maybe a few others. But for the most part, when I look at Europe, I, I think it's just a bunch of like old family companies um, maybe it's a generalization, but because you mentioned, you know, it, it, AI is starting to get adopted, um, you know, amongst uh, a lot of companies at this point. I mean, um, is my generalization accurate or am I totally off base when I think that a lot of companies are very conservative, um, you know, kind of mm -hmm. legacy and in the, in the kind of stuck back in the. Yeah, the I mean, there is something true about these stereotypes um, in a way, but yeah, most of it might not be the case, but mm -hmm. yeah, European companies are generally a bit uh, towards um, leaning to a safe side and mm -hmm. uh, iterating over what works. And um, I, th I think recently these EU guidelines for ethics have been released and it says a lot how EU approaches AI and likewise mm -hmm. the companies. Uh, it's a it's a bit uh, conservative towards uh, protecting people's privacy uh, and also, yeah, I mean, uh, keeping people first and uh, focusing on economic aspect uh, as secondary. So both go mm -hmm. parallel and that's the European way of thinking. And yeah, somewhere you, you must be right with that. Uh, American knows? companies are aggressive. We're the exact opposite, I would say. <laughs> We're like... Every state pretty much is up to, you know, it, it basically makes its own laws in terms of privacy. I think a privacy bill in Florida just got squashed. So that would have protected consumers, but Florida was like, nah, it's <laughs> consumers <laughs> don't need that. They, they, <laughs> what about, what about the companies? Um, so yeah, it, it's, right. it's still, you know, you have like California that has a privacy law and, uh, but the rest of the country, it's like, there's not really any sense of, um, you know, I, I would say it definitely puts companies first. And, and part of that, I think it works to America's advantage in the sense where we can definitely grow our economy to, you know, uh, you know, the world's largest, but at the same time, it definitely, there's no free lunch with that either. Right. Where, um, 
Right, right. I mean, I have no expectation that I have any sense of privacy when I'm using a, an application. Uh, <laughs> maybe my iPhone now, sort of, but like for the most part, it, that's just hmm. this fantasy land, unless you want to take matters into your own hands and use, you know, um, services that make you, you know, that protect you. And, yeah. And I do, but, you know, still. It, 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 it comes down a, to the way of thinking. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. It does. It totally mm. does. So, yeah. In in Europe, uh, people are concerned about uh, yeah the privacy a lot. That's the first issue that comes, and we have this uh, standard European law called GDPR, mm -hmm. and every European company abides to it. Also, the American companies. Right, it's quite interesting. I remember when GDPR first came out a few years ago. It, a lot of American companies. It was like literally, I think, the day before it came out. They're like, "Oh gosh, we have to uh, <laughs> rewrite our, our uh, privacy policy on our site and, and tracking and everything like that." And I think everyone yeah. was scared that the EU was going to go, uh, you know, um, prosecute them. But it seems like you know, it's definitely the bigger companies that are going to get whacked. Um, yeah, you know, and they are, I think. But yeah, it's, yeah it's a lot of them got got yeah hefty fines as well oh yeah it was a adoption curve that we had to pass through and still many companies are figuring out mm -hmm. yeah i mean apple i think they're the latest you know with uh, i don't know if it's related to uh um privacy per se but it was definitely i think monopolies with the app store and stuff and uh i mean if that um i'm not sure the exact specifics but i think if if eu prevails it's like 10 percent of global earnings or something which is like kind of nuts when you think of apple's revenue that's uh that's a lot so right, it's a, <laughs> so it, it's a lot it can happen like that in europe uh-huh but it always makes me wonder okay so you know back to ml like what i find fascinating too is just the different um ways people view ethics and machine learning based upon where they live like china is a much different scenario than i think mm. you're going to have in europe or we're going to have in the u.s and that's just how it is so right and a lot of it boils down to the cultural differences. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we all embrace them at the end of the day, but we have a different way of thinking. For example, China, Europe, and the US, and two interesting uh, ways of um, looking at AI or ML in Europe uh, quite was intriguing to me because uh, one is the deep fakes mm. in, in Europe, in the ethics guidelines, they, they said that all the deep fakes need to be labeled. So I think, American companies who are in social networks now in the US need to label all the deep fakes, which is a good step. And then also social scoring is banned in the in the Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're taking steps to at least do these for the common good, which might be good. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree with what, what the EU is going with a lot of this. Um, I mean, I, I traveled to China quite a bit before uh, COVID and just even mm -hmm. walking around there, it just felt like I was in a different universe or something and i didn't i didn't like it personally but that's just my cultural <laughs> differences right like cameras everywhere um right you know that's just the tip of the iceberg uh everything is everything is under surveillance like you'd pass under these um even these big uh um kind of uh they're like small rooms you'd go through but it would be uh they'd be sucking up all the information off your phone whoa that's uh quite a lot of surveillance, uh, at least for me as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but that's yeah. normal there. Right. So it's, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I, I could, I could take an opinion of what, you know, what's right or wrong, but I'm just going to say it's, it's mm. different. Right. Cause the Chinese would say, well, yeah, but you know, I'm not going to get into an argument on this one. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. yeah. But, but the uses of ML and AI though, again, it's, it's interesting just seeing how it's applied globally. Um, there are just different, different ways of doing it. And in China, for example, I suspect that they're, ML ops, for example, is actually probably really far ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. There are companies like Baidu and all these um, working on solutions. So mm -hmm. I think they must have already done quite some interesting solutions. Yeah, like TikTok, for example. Like that's basically an algorithm. Yeah. Like that's not even, mm. you're, 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 they've done a fantastic job on it, almost too good. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. yeah. It's quite <laughs> so, addictive, isn't it? Yeah, I think I was on it for twenty seconds. I was like, "This is gonna be, this is gonna be horrible." I need to delete it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, same, same with me. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, cool. Um, I think kind of wrapping up. Uh, if people want to find out more about you, um, what are some great places they could they can do that? 
Um, I think the best way is LinkedIn. I'm active on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, and also, um, I'm active uh, on um, Twitter uh, as well. So feel free to follow me there. And yeah, LinkedIn is the main place where I share thoughts and developments I keep sharing daily. So it's an opportunity to, for us to interact on a daily basis. I, I look forward to being in touch. Awesome. Yeah, and be, uh, be sure, shameless plug for your book. Be sure to check out uh, Engineering ML Ops Unpacked um, by Manuel Raj. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on. I really enjoyed talking to you and hope to do it again soon. So, Likewise, Joe. Thanks okay. for having me. Yeah, of course. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, have a good night. Yeah. All right, see ya. You bye. too. All right, take see care. Ya. Bye. Bye. Thanks.